from having to learn complicated codes, learning a new rule in every year, to having to learn intricate skills, being competitive will have you learning and trying new things to give you that edge. About two-thirds of U.S. workers have taken courses and trainings to advance their careers, according to Pew Research Center in March of 2016. Being able to understand your own learning style is very important. Something equally as important is being able to consistently learn faster and more efficiently. Well, that's exactly what we are diving into today. From San Bernardino, California, to your ears, this is the Team Hit Squad podcast. Lloyd Knox is in the building. It's Wednesday, December 26, 2018. Greetings and salutations to all of you skaters, entrepreneurs, and self help enthusiasts. This is episode number 15 of the Team Hit Squad podcast. It's the day after Christmas. Happy holidays to each and every single person out there. I hope you all had a fantastic, wonderful four day weekend for the people that do work uh, Monday through Fridays. Christmas was on the mellow side for us this year. We chilled at home all four days. Relaxation at its absolute finest. No Christmas movies. My son was playing with his new toys and he was having a lot of fun. Me and my wife, we watched YouTube like Matthew Santoro and Rob Dyke. And now I'm pretty much playing catch up with all the videos that I need to catch up on for the rest of the week. We have a very cool, fun subject for you today, but before we get that entire thing started, I want to start off by giving a quick shout out to our sponsors. First shout out is Anabolic Skate. You can check them out at anabolicskate.com. When you use code word Hit Squad TV, you get yourself 10% off. So make sure you use Hit Squad TV and get that 10 immediately. Empire Skate Shop. You can check them out at empireskateshop.com. You use Hit Squad TV, you get yourself 10% off. It's as easy as that. Rollercon.com. If you are going to Rollercon, it is July 17th and it ends on the 21st. It's an incredible five, six, seven, whatever days that you decide to want to go down to Vegas for. It's probably one of my, if it's, it's definitely always on my calendar. It's going to be my fifth year this year going, so super excited. Motaskates.com for the skater by the skater and big O tournament.com. It's coming at you this May from May 3rd all the way to May 5th. It's going to be a fun, fantastic time. We currently do have Team Hit Squad shirts available as well as the Mr. Testosterone Just Spin shirt. $25. It ships worldwide. All we need is your name, your size, the address, and we're going to get you rolling in some official Team Hit Squad gear. Hit Squad East will be happening not this weekend, but next weekend, January 6, 2019. The address is 1779 North Spring Garden Avenue in D-Land, Florida. Coach Victor Dutch will be there. Speed Bryu, Dizzy Izzy, hometown phenom Olivia Glisson. I'll be there teaching you videography and help you how to grow your brand as an athlete. And newly added coach number 111 from New Jack City, Jacksonville Roller Derby, Jam Sterello. So make sure you go out there once again. It is Sunday, January 6, 2019, and the address is 1779 North Spring Garden Avenue, D-Land, Florida. And if you want to find the page or the event page on Facebook, just type in Hit Squad University East and it should pop up. So we hope to see you there. We have a roller derby art show that's being thrown by us. Hit Squad TV, and in a collaboration with the Alley Gallery in downtown Pomona, right by the Glass House, a mural of Hit Squad TV and Roller Derby will be painted on the wall by the phenomenal Cloak STP. There will be photographs from Tough Girls on Eight Wheels, Michael Weiss, Tristan King, the Angry Artist, will have some art on display as well. Check out the art. Check out the art everywhere. It's going to be open for the public, so you can walk around in different galleries and stuff. Um... We will also be telling a couple stories of our favorite moments in the sport, as well as speaking about the importance of growing the sport through junior participation. So if you want to go, the address is 101 South Main Street, Pomona, California. And that is going to be January 12th, 2019. So the first two weeks of 2019 is already filled with hit squad related stuff for us and that's the way we like it we we want to make sure that 
2019 out of the 52 weeks out there, we want to travel at least. I want to, I, I really truthfully want to travel. I want to do like maybe 30 weeks, 30 weeks. I don't want to be at home. I want to be out somewhere in the world, filming, working, doing something. I want to be able to be on the road more than anything this year. Not that I'm trying to avoid my family. <laughs> it's just that we need to grow the brand more. We need to grow what we are doing. And in order for us to do that, we need to travel. We need to expand. And I think with our current reputation, as well as our working and our strategy and our and our Christmas crispness, not Christmas, crispness with a P in there, crispness of the way we film and the way we edit, I think we are a valuable commodity to anyone that ever really wants to work with us and advance themselves. Um, and finally, we have the new Team Hit Squad album, Blood, Sweat, Years. It's an instrumental album created by myself. And it is under the name Team Hit Squad. Hashtag Team Hit Squad. And it will be released in January 2019. So keep an ear out for that. And it will be available on all streaming and downloading sites. Now, today's subject. I worked for a glass company for four years. And the company was called Cardinal Glass. And it was probably up to the very end. It was my favorite job that I had ever attained to at that point. <clears throat> I started off as a general worker. Small place too. At the time, it only had two shifts, and each shift had nine people. In the office, they only had about four people. So we were under 30. We did not have that many people working there. And the way that everything went on, like when I first got hired on, I got hired as general worker. Basically, all that means is as soon as uh, the, the glass would come out on a conveyor belt, on a massive conveyor belt. And once it was done cooking and curing and processing all that stuff, it finally comes out on a conveyor belt. And depending on what size it is, it could be something as small as a 5 inches by 5 inches. Or they could come out as massive as 72 by 32 inches. Basically like a sliding door glass. You could kind of picture that. So those would come out from the conveyor belt. And I would have to... And we had gloves. The way that we protected ourselves, we always had a hard hat helmet. Um, we had a sweater jacket that would protect all the way from your neck all the way down to your torso. And it covered your arms. And it had these um, little strings in the jacket that you can put your thumb over. That way your sleeve would always stay up and you would put two types of gloves on before you even attempted to try and touch this glass because obviously it's glass, it's sharp. So you would pick it up from its side and you would you would kind of uh, lift it up since it would come out flat, you pick it up from its side and now it's laying on its side. You kind of go on the corner a little bit and you pick it up and you pretty much have it like that, the way you're holding it like, a, like an L, I guess. I wish I could kind of show you, but this is kind of how the hand is. And you would have to put it on a on a thing that looks like a bungee. Um, they were like sliding columns. You would put the glass on the bottom and it was a guide that would lead you from where you put it all the way to its back. And once you put it there, you make sure that you didn't throw it in there or hit it or hit something. Like you have to pay attention. There's some little pieces of glass in there and you would hit it and... If you didn't pay attention and you did hit it, the glass would shatter on you. And you're like, oh, now you got to go get a shop vac and you would have to clean it up. And I was doing that job for about a good four months, four or five months. And it would, it, I learned a lot from that point. I learned that no one really cared how well you were doing, although that's what I originally thought. Because companies would always say, we got an eye on you, we got an eye on people, we're, we're watching, you know, we're doing stuff. And I didn't really ever believe them for one reason or another until they actually showed that they were paying attention and they actually did care. So much so that I was the newest person 
there they got uh, hired on. And from there, they moved me up to the next position, which eventually was called the loader. And the loader's main job, like, they moved me a couple steps, right? So now I'm at this loading area, and what happens is this glass that I am now dealing with, I was originally dealing with tempered glass. Tempered glass, if you hit it, it shatters and it turns into a million little pieces. You know, those are the type of glass that you see at houses now, uh, especially the newer houses. Or if you've already replaced your windows before you bought them or whatever, or after you bought them and you replaced the glass, you'll notice that you'll have tempered glass. You no longer have raw glass. If you have raw glass at home, I suggest you change them. That is dangerous. Super dangerous. If that thing breaks for whatever reason, those big shards fall down, just be careful. If you got them, be careful. But I was now dealing with raw glass because it was coming down on a conveyor belt. Now, at this time, it's coming in a different type of conveyor belt. It's coming from the cutting table. And the cutting table is who originally is giving you these raw pieces of glasses. They, The machine that he's they're dealing with up there, which I'll tell you later on, um, cuts the glass. And it's they send it on a conveyor belt where it gets logoed. And the sharp edges get seamed down with um, with sanding paper. It would just sand the corners. That way, not just the little corners on the four corners, but the entire side of the glass, top and bottom. And I would wear over there now on the loading area, I would load up all these pieces of glass. So one bed of glass, which I would fill up this entire section of a conveyor belt, and I would have to do it in about 60 seconds. I would have to load up anywhere between three pieces of glass all the way to about maybe 12, depending on how small this load is. And every single start of an order is always the smallest pieces. Like, it, because it's the computer up there is trying to fit as many pieces as humanly possible, or mechanically possible at this case, mechanically possible on a sheet. And I'll tell you more about how big this glass is. But going back over here uh, to where I was working at as a loader, I would grab the glass from these conveyor belts. And you could picture the conveyor belt being like the I Love Lucy episode where it, they're eating that chocolate. Except picture that conveyor belt about 15 feet wide. And you're putting these pieces of glass on there to make sure that they're not hitting each other. And it's going to go through this thing called the washer. And it's pouring water on the bottom and on the top to make sure that all of this angel hair, all this um, sh like little pieces of glass gets completely washed off before it goes into this thing called the furnace. And that's where it cooks it. It starts cooking it and it starts tempering. From there, eventually, it goes into the quench where it's just nothing but air. And that's how it's curing it. That's how it's making it just A-OK. -okay. Now, if that glass has any imperfections, like let's say uh, the machinery forgot to, uh, with the sandpaper, really go through on the glass. Like if it just barely lightly touched it, the quench would know because it'll shatter in the quench. So if you're not doing your job right, they can tell. They can automatically tell by... The, the fact that it broke is like the only reason why it broke is because the loader over here accidentally chipped the glass or didn't do a well enough job of seaming the side. So you would throw it in there. It breaks and they're looking at you. And the reason why he's so mad is because this person would have to clean up that mess and you didn't have to, which was always a a bad mixture when you see the glass breaking, you're like, oh, no, what did I do wrong? So I would walk over there and be like, what happened, man? What happened, baby? I, I thought we was doing so good. Yeah, man, I'll check it out to see what's going on. If one of those glasses was to survive, they would remove the glove and would keep a thing, just a thumb out. And just very lightly would touch the glass just to feel it. And you could feel if it's either sharp or... Or if it's dull. If it's dull, that means it got seamed well. If it's too sharp, that means that thing barely just lightly tapped at it. <laughs> lightly tapped at it. That's funny. Lightly tapped it. So, 
And before all of that stuff too, it goes into this, um, before going into the quench and before going into the furnace and after going through the washer, this computer reads it and the computer can tell you what is the diameter or what is the thickness, I should say, of the glass and the thicknesses that we had. And you could kind of tell what kind of glass you have at home. The thinner, the, the thinner of the bunch, you have 3.1 3.9, 4.7, 5.7, and 6.0. We also did have a 2.2, two, uh, 2 .2, but unfortunately, those things were really thin. I mean, those things wouldn't really protect you all too well, and there's, it's, yeah, you don't want to go with 2.2. .2. Anyways, I'm not trying to sell you glass. I spent the first year there, and I absolutely loved it. Eventually, the company opened up to have three shifts, 24 hours a day, Monday through Friday, of course. Um, I was offered the opportunity to go to the top of the food chain, the nine-person food chain, and became a cutting lead. Now, going into and becoming a cutting lead was a completely different monster. There was big comparisons between doing the bungee work and doing what I was originally doing as a general worker and then going into becoming a washer where I was just wa a loader, I should say. And I didn't really struggle too much with that. It wasn't until I got to the cutting table that I really started seeing exactly what I was all about. And as far as the cutter goes, the opportunities and the experience that I had on it was pretty much as follows. I had to operate a table where this table is pretty massive. It is about 144 inches by 144 inches. It's, it's just big. It's a big, think of it as a big pool table without the corners. It's just big. It's smooth. And it's also a um, air. They're like an air hockey table, but on a pool table felt. So when the glass was on top of this table and the air was on, they and you would just leave them by themselves, they would start kind of moving around by themselves. Because it's the air, and the air is kind of levitating it. When you would want the air off, you would hit this switch on the bottom, and it would kill all the air, and all the glass would just stay there. Um, we always had it on because you always had to have it on and it would make things so much easier to move from there to a conveyor belt because these, some, some of these pieces that were being cut out were something as short as three feet to anywhere as long as 144 inches. You would have to move that entire piece of glass. So, and, and this is insane. Some of the biggest pieces of glasses that I rem remember ever moving on top of the conveyor belt was... Uh, I think it was 139. It wasn't 144. It was 139 because that was the limit of these seamers. Because when it would go through a, through the seaming machine, there was this um, there was only one movable object that would open up wide to let this piece of glass go in. And it would seam the edges of the top and the bottom. Then it would hit to the particular end of a conveyor belt and it would start going forward and it would seem now the left and right side on the bottom and the top um, on the bottom and the top of the glass so it would only open up to 139 inches so it was something as uh, long as that and the glass was as wide as 42 and 3 eighths and it it was just and it, it was the heaviest glass that we had 5.7 i'll tell you about the 6.0 later but this 5.7 it was heavy and there's a sticker on it that you wouldn't put on till when it was measured but we saw how heavy this glass was this glass alone was 125 pounds i believe just by itself and you have to pick it up from the very from the bottom and try to get it on this conveyor belt that thing could snap but it's so thick it's so strong that it's not going to snap on you it'll just pick up you know like it won't flex in the middle it just picks up it's just a big heavy glass you would throw it on the conveyor belt and kind of slide it of course you're wearing 
two to three types of gloves on your hand to protect yourself. And the people that work in the glass industry, I hope they do treat you as well as the people at Cardinal because I've heard war and scary stories about places in Los Angeles that deal with glass. And they're going out there with like the rubber gloves that you get, you wash your, that you wash your dishes with, you know, like, what do you no, 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 no. And they don't even have like any protective mesh. Like as soon as we got to the cutting table, I had chaps on, I had my steel toe boots, I had this jacket. And it would always protect us. And believe it or not, we would get hit by these pieces of glass. Not because someone was being funny and trying to stab you. It's just that you're throwing glass into this dumpster. Sometimes they've told you don't throw it past three feet. If you're throwing it and tossing it, that's dangerous. You get fired. And people took that serious. We saw one person when I was a general worker. This dude was dumb. Threw it five feet. Got caught got fired it's that serious you just never know and i heard some scary war stories there like i remember this i don't remember his name and i'm definitely even if i knew i wouldn't put him on blast like that but i remember one week before i came in and the reason why i was brought in was because this guy had an accident there and they were picking up this 5.7 Thick, the, the thickest glass once again picked it up and was kind of holding it in front of him and on the other side is being picked up by another person and you're kind of walking backwards to try and put it on this skateboard that you can put it you don't no longer have to carry it you can just guide it on this skateboard looking thing you know and this guy was not paying attention and walked and hit a beam behind him. Well, the glass tipped and the corner hit and the glass shattered. It was raw glass and it fell on top of him. He had a hard hat on, so he was protecting himself from his head, but it did not protect him from his face. It didn't protect him. I mean, the the, the jacket did its job. He still got lacerations, I believe, but he had lacerations on his face and it was a very intense very scary moment i'm glad that i wasn't there i'm glad i didn't get told about that until like maybe a year later where i was already doing that job i'm like wait what now and they've since made a lot of corrections they put face masks on there now so just in case stuff like that was happening we got better gloves better feeling gloves um, they took a lot of, a lot of great stuff that was going on over there and made it even better. Um, I was operating a crane. This crane would come up to these big sheets of glass. Once again, 144 by 96, the crane would go to the glass and this crane had suction cups. So it would go right to the middle of it. The suction would activate and slowly it would go up, pull behind and then go completely up and pull behind and now it's up one sheet midair and it would fly down this corridor and it would create and complete this turn. It would go backwards and it would lay the glass on this tilt. And once the glass hit and once it landed safely, the tilt would start going down after the crane moves. And the tilt had rubber wheels. So once it fully locked in, the wheels would start turning and it would start moving it north to this um, area where eventually this cutting head starts cutting the glass and the glass gets cut by um, a glass cutter that is on this head that is flying. It's flying, cutting the shapes, cutting how everything is supposed to be. And it was really awesome being able to see this machine just flying cut these shapes cut um regular sizes anywhere between five by five to it even cut um hexagons it cut triangles and it was just all preset shapes but someone inside the office could also create custom made shapes for example if someone wanted um if if this if you're friend made a door frame and wanted a particular hand cut thing they can actually create it on the computer to match that if they didn't if they weren't able to do that they would just pretty much give us the cut out shape of it and we would have to cut it by hand 
And that is where this whole learning thing kind of can kind of goes into play now. I learn very differently from a lot of people. Um, just like I'm sure you learn differently from a lot of people. I majorly learn from hands-on experience. I like putting my hands and going to work. Um, that's the way that I learn how to play guitar. That's the way I learn how to play bass. That's definitely the way that I learn how to play drums. So being able to learn in that way has helped me understand how good I can possibly be when I can control my fate in a way as far as learning stuff. If I just had to just strictly go by reading it and therefore the way that I would prove that I knew it would be by a test, I'd do terrible. I, I would do absolutely terrible. It's one of the main reasons why I hated school. I hated the fact that I was being graded by by my intellectualness, although I, although I do understand why we need to have that type of education, even if we generally don't like it, especially like I, I would I would agree. I kind of came up with this weird idea and the first from from kindergarten all the way to eighth grade, you know, we got to learn our general education. I, I, I think so. I, we, we would have to learn about um, social studies, mathematics, English, grammar, all, you know, all the, the, these general basic things that have that has been taught throughout the years. But I think when we go to high school, wouldn't it be awesome if we would go to high school to not get just a high school diploma, but to get yourself a certificate that'll get you out into the next level? They would still have some general uh, classes in there, but mostly, especially like, I don't know, it's, it's kind of difficult and I definitely don't want to go into that entire route because I think we would take another 20 minutes and I don't want to make this podcast longer than what it actually has to be. But more or less, the sense would be you go into high school and there's this abundance of options of what you can possibly learn that can teach, like if, if I, if you know that you maybe you might not be good at school. I mean, I didn't know I was I was not good at school until I hit high school. I was like, wow, I really don't want to do this. But instead of just getting a high school diploma and just learning your general education, and that's pretty much it because that's what I got. I just got my general ed. General ed didn't teach me about taxes. It didn't teach me about survival. It didn't teach me about job interviews. So what if we taught that at school? And... Like, I remember in my senior year, I started taking computer information systems, and I got a certificate off of that. And I wasn't able to put it into play until I started working at Sears, where I was like, yeah, I got computer information systems. I know how to uh, work on Excel, Word, this and that. And now it started got me thinking now, like, what if we did offer that stuff and it would be a legitimate certificate, something that you would get from college, but you actually give that to students. I know they have that built because that's what I got, but it wasn't as recognized as a college certificate. But nonetheless, it was it was something really cool. And what if we offer that to all of the students where once they graduate, they get two diplomas. They get one from this and something that they generally want to learn. Um, I'll just leave the subject there. If you all want to talk about that particular subject more, please send us an email at hitsquadtelly at gmail.com or send me a message on all of our social media. I'd love to talk about that more. It was a conversation that me and my best friend had that turned into a great one hour conversation. So um, if you all want to talk about that, by all means, come through and talk about it. But going back to working at Cardinal, I had to learn a lot of different things. Um, I had to learn how to load in glass by using the Rico. And I learned that I did better when I did hands-on stuff. For example, when I had to load in glass, I had to use this thing called a Rico. And think of it as a forklift. But instead of the forks being in the front, it's a big, long bed. It, 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 it's ridiculously long. I think the bed in total is like 188 inches. 188, pretty far. And you would, and it would be right in front of you. And the way that the wheels would pivot, it would pivot differently. Uh, since the wheels in motion that you are operating is right under you, and the flatbed is in front of you, you you would have to drive a little differently. And you, it would take some time to get used to. But I got the general 
point of it all and how it works. So you would have to pick up the glass like that. The glass is anywhere between five to about 25,000 pounds, depending on the thickness of it. So the flatbed would pick it up on the steel frame. The steel frame had the glass on it, um, laying on top of rubber, I don't know, these big rubber mats. So that way the glass doesn't hit, shatter, or anything like that. It just kind of holds in place. So you would load it up and put it in its designated area inside of the gantry. And the gantry is basically where it holds all of the glass. And the way that the glass would also get loaded in there as well was being able to load it in manually, which is an aerial crane. And that was probably the scariest moment being able to learn how to load up glass. So I'm holding up anywhere between 2,000 to about 5,000 pounds on two slings, picking up heavy glass and having to levitate it and being able to move it down this corridor and then having to grab the glass and kind of gently push it to start turning from left to right. You know, kind of kind of creating that 180 since it's hanging. It stops at 180 and now I move it down and I lay it on this um once again that that steel um the steel A-frame and you load the glass on there. That's pretty much it. You unstrap it, put it down gently, unstrap it, get out of there and continue your work day. I learned how to do those things very quickly, very quickly. But the one thing that confused me, for whatever reason, fractions. Oh, no. I hated fractions in high school. I didn't, I don't know, I don't know about fractions, man. Since high school, I hated them. I knew whole numbers and decimals. I know dollars and cents. But in order for me to solidify my job and my importance to this job, I needed to learn fractions. Loading glass, both aerial-wise and the Rico, and it was just an insane time. Now, we all learn differently. I learned by doing. I didn't like school. I already told you about that. Um, it taught me that I, like, I genuinely shouldn't judge and deem myself dumb because I didn't do well in chemistry or algebra too. I knew I wasn't going to college by the time I was I hit high school, you know? I didn't like the atmosphere, and I just sadly didn't see the point. I always felt like I was going to be okay without school. I'm not really sure why. I don't know I don't know if my parents even felt the same. But life didn't scare me at first. At first, it didn't scare me. I quickly learned that in order for me to advance in life, if I didn't want to go to school, I needed to hustle. And not drug cartel hustle. The jobs that I had included in my life throughout the years have been as follows. I was a dishwasher at Jose's Mexican Restaurant. Then moved up to be busboy. And then started working at the cashier. Then I worked at Sears Fitness Section. I would sell ellipticals, treadmills. Um, my favorite thing and my favorite story that I ever had from Sears was there was this person that came up i think it was like a wednesday too at like 11 a.m in july there's nothing going on like what are you doing here and this person comes up and starts looking at our inversion table and our inversion table will flip you upside down and it would like stretch your back and this person was interested in wanting to use it so i kind of like go up to him like hey buddy how's it going See, you're checking out this inversion table. Yeah. It's, uh, it'll make your back feel really good. Really good. I definitely didn't talk like that to the customer. I talked way more professionally, but you get what I'm saying. The person didn't want to help. I was like, I get it. I get it. I respect it. You let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to be over here by the cash register. All right, buddy? You take care. I was putting stuff away. About three minutes later, I kind of turn around, and this person is on the conversion table. And he's trying to lock its feet. And I was like, hey, did you want me to help you lock it in? He's like, no, I got it. Thank you. I was like, all right, cool. 
So this person starts going backwards to start feeling it. And he's kind of controlling it pretty well. And then finally locks into the 180 position. So he's upside down now. And no more than as soon as he locks in, about two seconds later, his feet slip out. Smacks his head right on top of this mat that we would have. And the mat left the design on the top of his head. Uh, and I saw it too. I'm like, oh, hey, man, you all right? This dude got up and ran, ran out like, whoa. And you all of a sudden, you see loss prevention LP run out. They run out to try and go get the person. I thought the dude was in trouble. No, they wanted to make sure the dude was okay. Like, hey, man, you hit yourself really hard. Are you good? Is everything okay? And I think he wrote a report, but it didn't involve me or anything like that. It was more along the lines of, and they kind of told me, they kind of hinted at it later. Like, you're all right, man. You're all right. It, it was more like he he understood it was him that messed up. And if he was ever saying anything, we have the audio and we have the video of you offering help. So don't worry about that. So, yeah, that was probably my favorite story from Sears. There is a lot of other fun times there as well, but definitely Sears Fitness section. I worked at Radio Shack. I worked by going door to door and selling Kirby vacuums. You know Kirby vacuums, those people that come to your house and try to sell you a $2,000 vacuum. I did that. Never sold one. I was terrible at selling. At Radio Shack, selling wise, I did really bad. At Sears Fitness Section, I did really bad. I mean, I sold stuff. I, I kept my job long enough. And at least for these first few jobs, it was my decision to leave. Actually, pretty much all of them, it was all my decision to leave. And the reason why I would leave these things, especially Kirby Vacuums, and I did door-to-door -door toy sales. I was a door-to-door -door uh, toy salesman going to different businesses and trying to sell them toys like... That's crazy. And I remember I sold $150 worth of toys. These toys were like five bucks each. I hustled that day. Sold. I sold. I was like, out of those $150, guaranteed $100 is mine. Guaranteed $100 is mine. Super happy. You know how much I got, fam? Fam, I got $12. I got $12 out of the $150 I sold. I quit. Right then and there. I was like, nope. And I was only on this job for, I think, three days. I was like, nope, I'm done. After that, I worked at a kids after school program. I would help kids learn. I would coach basketball, football, baseball. We played um, played a couple tournaments in basketball, never lost. Holla! I was a great after school program specialist. I was there for three years, worked for three different schools. It was the funnest time that I ever had. Um, I started with my band, The New Danger, and learned how to play guitar, bass, drums, and started performing during this time. Then I became a parts driver for Rancho Foreign Car Parts. You guessed it, I would drive car parts to different... Um, Different companies, different places, whoever was buying them, i drop it off to them. Um, then I started building air tanks. Then I worked at a warehouse. Then I started making glass. Didn't make it, I would cut glass. And at some point in between the warehouse and the glass making thing, um, I started learning and I started filming roller derby. So everything at some point, You've had to learn something, right? Throughout the years, you've more or less understand what your learning style is. Learning fractions was absolutely horrible. Horrible. I hated it. Learning how to drive the Rico and forklift, no problems. No accidents in the two years that I drove. And learning how to load glass off of uh, off those slings, three feet suspended off the ground, gave me no real problems. But fractions, ugh. Fractions. Basically, I learned as I went along. Eventually, I created a ruler on this cardboard that I wrote down the fractions and numbers on it. So when I had downtime, I could pull it out and I would kind of look at it and, and learn from there. The massive projector that was on top of the cutting table, when once the glass would be ejected and it would more or less fly out, you can picture a 144 by 96 glass 
flying at you at about seven to eight miles an hour on air. And that thing is coming at you. You have to stop it, but you can't stop it by putting your 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 palms up to be like, oh gosh, and you try to back out. You you would more or less put your hands on top of it to slow it down, or on, at least on the edges to like kind of push it off because you got to remember it's levitating because of the air, the air table, you know, and it has felt like we were telling you like a pool table felt. Com combine and mix that with the air hockey table. That's what you got. That's what this glass is floating on. So when that thing is shooting out at you, you kind of more or less stop it and guide it back a little bit. And you break it out and you start going from there. And so the, the massive projector would tell you the layouts and the numbers as well on how big this piece of glass is. Like, for example, the glass could be 50 by 16 and 3 eighths. Every day I focused on breaking out the glass, which is once the cutting head cuts the glass, the computer ejects the 144 by 96 sheet and the machine would cut the templates on the glass by the by hand or by a bar on the table under the glass. You would slightly raise the glass to break out the sheet. And on the computer, it would leave you breaking points. Like this is a break point that you can safely pick up the glass and it would break with no real problem. The screen would also show you the layout and you would learn all of the different patterns, what the scrap was that you would throw away and what the actual product is. It was difficult because it's, it's glass. You can't read what's on the glass. That stuff that's telling you up there, hey, this is 50 by 16, 3 8, It's not telling you on the glass because it's glass. It, it just got cut. You need to learn the difference between what's being shown at you on that screen and what you were doing on the table. And that job required you to be fast, confident, and accurate. And within those two years that I was a cutting lead, that's exactly what I learned. I learned to become confident. I learned how to be fast. And I learned how to be accurate. That mentality that I learned there at Cardinal, I brought over to Hit Squad TV. As far as un me understanding that I learn by doing. I learn by going on the way. That's how I learned how to video. That's how I learned how to film. That's how I learned how to edit. I learned on the go. Because there's no time for me to try and sit down and study. I gotta go, baby. I gotta, I gotta go. Boom, 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 boom. So, I eventually left, though... Because I pretty much hit the glass ceiling there. Didn't you get what I'm saying? I remember seeing my coworker Caesar, and he was working there already at that point for 22 years. And I looked at him one day, and I realized that I didn't want to be there at 50, and be as angry as this man to stress, be be so hateful. I eventually made the jump and took Hit Squad TV to where we were at today. I thank Cardinal for the fact of everything that they taught me, everything that I've learned. Um, if it wasn't for them, Hit Squad TV really wouldn't have this type of drive and determination because of this job. And for that, I really do appreciate Cardinal for their time. So I've already told you that I've learned, I learned by doing. So I found this test online called, what is your learning style? And the test, if you want to take it as well, is educationplanner.org. So that is exactly where this is from. And let me pull up the test because I do have it right here. I've never taken it before, so I don't know exactly what it's going to be. But it is, um, if you want to go to educationplanner.org you could type in and try to find the test under self-assessment and we're going to take the test called what is your learning style so here we go question number one what kind of book would you like to read for fun a book with lots of pictures a book with lots of words or a book with word searches and cross puzzles now i'm going to answer this as truthfully and honestly as it's humanly possible. I like word searches and I like crossword puzzles. I really do. On Although I don't have the, the books, I do have them. That is the only game that I have on my iPhone. It's just cross, uh, not crosswords, uh, word searches. Next question. When you are not sure how to spell a word, what are you most likely to do? Write it down till it looks right? 
spell it out to see if it sounds right or trace the letters in the air. Finger spelling. Oh man, I'm kind of all three. But I'll go with spell it out to see if it sounds right. But I've definitely have caught myself doing the finger spelling, especially with numbers. I do that with numbers. Um, write it down until it looks right. I, I kind of do that too. I'm kind of split. But it sounds like I would do the sound right more. Number three, you're on, you're out shopping for clothes and you're waiting to pay in line. What are you most likely to do while you're waiting? Look around at other clothes on the racks? Talk to the person next to you in line? Or fidget moving back and forth? I most likely will fidget back and forth. I will definitely, well, if there's someone next to me, I'll definitely talk. See, that's kind of difficult because I wish the question would be a little more accurate. Like, you're shopping on some clothes, but I'm assuming that it says, talk to the person next to you in line. It's like, hey, what'd you buy? Great. Yeah, I'd probably be moving, fidgeting back and forth. When you see the word cat, what do you do first? Picture a cat in your mind. Say the word cat to yourself. Think about being with a cat. I think I say the word cat. I think I might say the word cat to myself, like cat, cat. And then I picture it. And then I picture thinking about being with a cat. Number five, what's the best way for you to study for a test? Do you read the book or the notes and review pictures or charts? Have someone ask you questions that you can answer out loud or make up index cards that you can review? I like index cards. Next. What's the best way for you to learn about how something works, like a computer or video game? Do you get someone to show you, read about it, or listen to someone explain it, or figure it out on your own? I like to read about it or listen to someone explain it, especially on YouTube. I graduated from YouTube University. That should be a real thing. Guaranteed it most likely will one day. Number seven, if you went to school, if you went to a school dance, what would you be most likely to remember the next day? The faces of the people who were there, the music that was played, or the dance moves you did, and the food you ate. Um, let's see. If I went to the party, I usually wouldn't remember the the people that were there more than anything. Number eight. What do you find most distracting when you're trying to study? People walking past you, loud noises, or an uncomfortable chair? Uh, I think it's people walking past me. Definitely. Keeps my eyes off of the page or whatever I'm trying to do. When you're angry, this is number nine. When you're angry, what are you most likely to do? Put on your mad face, yell and scream, or you slamming doors? I'm putting on my mad face. I don't really like to just yell and scream for no reason or uh, slam doors. That's usually what I would stay at. I usually would put a mad face. Um, Number 10. When you are happy, what are you most likely to do? Smile from ear to ear? Talk up a storm? Or act really hyper? Um, I think I like smile from ear to ear. I think I do. I think I do that. When in a new place, how do you find your way around? Do you look at a map or a directory that shows you where everything is? Ask someone for directions or start walking around until you find what you're looking for? I just walk around until I find something. It usually helps me as well memorize the place since I'm not just looking at a map the entire time. I'm visually setting um, setting like markers in my head like, okay, I've been here. I can remember this. I can remember this door, you know, so on and so forth. Number 12. Of these three classes, which is your favorite? Art, music, or gym? That's tough. That is that is absolutely tough. I love music, I love art, and I love sports. Um, my own personal favorite when I was going to school, gym. Definitely gym. I, I love gym. I, I played basketball all day every day. I played other sports all day every day as well. When you hear a song on the radio, and, and going back to the other question real quick, Although music and art now really consume my life more than anything, 
the reason why I didn't pick music or art was because those things I learned by myself because I realized how artistic I was and how much I genuinely loved making music and just creating anything and try to make it as art or as artsy as possible. That's a terrible analogy and I apologize for that. But I love art. I love music and music is an art. I think the videography that we do, we try to make it as artistic as possible. So um, although those run and consume my life at school, I love playing because I love doing. All right, number 13. When you hear a song on the radio, what are you most likely to do? Picture the video that goes along with it. Sing or hum along with the music or start dancing or tapping your feet. Oh, I definitely start singing. Definitely start singing. Number 14. What do you find most distracting when in class? Lights that are too bright or too dim? Noises from the hallway or outside the building like traffic or someone cutting grass? Or the temperature being too hot or too cold? Definitely noises from the hallway or outside the building. Noises that really have nothing to do with me. My mind's like, I wonder what they're doing out there. 15. What do you like to do to relax? Read, listen to music, or exercise? To relax, I listen to music for sure. I listen to music or watch a YouTube video or something to get myself on some educational gain. Number 16. What is the best way for you to remember a friend's phone number? Save it on your phone. Duh. Wait, hold on. Picture the numbers on the phone as you would dial them. Say it out loud over and over again or write it down or store it in your phone or contact list. Honestly, that's how we pretty much all do it nowadays. It's ever since the cell phone, we kind of don't put an emphasis on learning numbers anymore other than it's numbers that you would have to absolutely know like your emergency contact. But that's pretty much it. Everyone else, like even now, my wife got a new phone number, I think like two, three weeks ago, and I still don't know it. I have it written down and I text her every day. I just don't remember the phone number. All right, we're almost done. Number 17. If you won a game, which of these three prizes would you choose? A poster for the wall, a music CD or MP3 download, or a game of some kind, like a football or a soccer ball? Mm, that's uh, That one's kind of tough. I would most likely want a music CD because a poster on my wall, if I was back in my childhood, I would probably love a poster on my wall. But music and MP3, definitely. Which would you rather go to with a group of friends? A movie, a concert, or an amusement park? Mm. I... I'd probably go to a concert. That'd be pretty cool. I've I've definitely done amusement parks and they're so much fun. But a concert is just it's unbelievable to me. I loved concerts. Um I don't know if I really do them all that much anymore because I've gotten older and I'm starting to realize I don't really like people all that much. Just only the selected few that I want to conversate with. Number 19. What are you most likely to remember about new people you meet? Their face, but not their name. Their name, but not their face. Or what you talk about with them. Definitely their face, but not their name. In roller derby and in music, we I've, I've had a blessed opportunity to meet an incredible amount of people that have told us how great our videos are and what we do is awesome, but... Uh, it sucks when we run into them again and we don't remember their name and I don't want to crush anyone's feelings like it's not your fault it's just that who knows what my mind was going through through that time maybe I'm running a bunch of numbers or a bunch of situations in my head and we introduce or talk to each other but I do try my best to learn their names and learn faces as much as I can as well as try to remember what we talked about before because it's it's kind of an icebreaker like oh hey jan i remember you how's it going how's the kids oh that makes that that, that just opens up the floodgates of familiarity so awesomely number 20 the last one when you give someone directions to your house what are you most likely to tell them 
a description of building and landmarks they will pass on the way, the name of the roads or the streets they'll be on, or follow me. It'll be easier if I just show you how to get there. Um, I will most likely say the roads and streets they will be on, but definitely would do the follow me. It'll be easier if I show you how to get there. Definitely, I would go with that as a close number one, but it'll be number two. Just in case, like, it'll depend on the situation, too. Like, if me and you are at a Carl's Jr., and you're like, hey, let's go to your house. I'm like, yeah, for sure. This is how you're going to get there. Like, I'm not going to give you the directions. I'm just like, just follow me. Let's go. So we're going to do the name and roads of the streets and the stuff they'll be on. And we are about to find out what I am. So, my learning styles are in, and I am, let's see, your score is 45% auditory. You are an auditory learner. I have 25% visual and 30% tactical. So, auditory. Let's learn about it real quick. If you are an auditory learner, you learn by hearing and listening. You understand and remember things you have heard. That's very true. You store information by the way it sounds, and you have an easier time understanding spoken instructions that are, than actual written ones. You often learn by reading out loud because you have to hear it or speak it in order to know it. That's so true. So true. As an auditory learner, you probably hum or talk to yourself. I do. I really do. Or others if you become bored. True. People may think you are not paying attention, even though you may be hearing and understanding everything that is being said. So true. The one person I'm trying to fix that with, though, is my wife, Ivy. I'm so sorry, baby. Sometimes. I'm so sorry. So sorry. Here's some of the things that auditory learners like you can do to learn better. Sit where you can hear. Nice. Have your hearing checked on a regular basis. Okay. Use flashcards to learn new words. Read them out loud. It's true. I like that. Read stories, assignments, and directions out loud. I do that. Yes. Record yourself spelling words and then listen to the recordings. I like that. Have test questions read out loud to you. And study new, study new material by reading it out loud. I like that advice because I do that with um, YouTube videos. Uh, when I want to learn something, I'm not going to go to a website and read it. I'm going to go on YouTube, type it in, and I'm going to visually and I'll be able to hear what this person's seeing so I can visually and I can definitely hear it. And okay, I, I like that. I remember and remember this, that you need to hear things, not just see things in order to learn. Well, that's wow. That thing told me a lot about myself that I I kind of knew, but not really. So, I am an auditory learner. If you want to check this test out, make sure you go to educationplanner.com slash students slash self-assessments. It is going to be under what's your learning style. So that is pretty much all we have for you today on the show. I want to thank each and every single individual that's tuned in. We are about to hit the hour mark. This is probably the first time we ever actually hit the hour mark. Um, I want to thank you all once again for tuning in. I apologize for not being on these past few days. I mean, it was the holidays, so you all were with family. I was with family. You know, let's get back on the horse, huh? And... Uh, before I let you go, I want to give a quick shout out to all the sponsors, AnabolicSkate.com. Make sure you check them out, EmpireSkateShop.com. When you go to AnabolicSkate.com and EmpireSkateShop.com, when you use Hit Squad TV, you get yourself 10% off. RollerCon.com, all of the tickets are all still available right now. Prices are going up for the MVP passes, so if you were thinking about getting the MVP pass, I suggest that you get it before December ends because it goes up by a lot of money. And motaskates.com for the skater by the skater and bigotournament.com May 3rd to May 5th. Make sure you go to Eugene, Oregon or you actually get yourself the live stream. Um, and that is pretty much it. I'm kind of sad that we're not going to hit the hour mark. But if you all don't mind, I want to wait at least 31 seconds before we close it down so I can officially say that I have a podcast that went up about an hour. Um, 
This was a particularly fun subject to talk about because I did love and enjoy my time with Cardinal. It was just the fact that I needed to make my leap of faith. I was already losing faith in that job. And I I was did not want to be held by that glass ceiling anymore. And I needed to I needed to lose this security, this job that I had that was cost like I was making a lot of money here. And for me going from that guaranteed job, it was nine to five, Monday through Friday. Doing that to all of a sudden, I had to struggle and I, I I have to claw just to try and get money just to pay for the house, to pay for food, to pay for clothes. Like, I love that. I'm so glad I left that job in security because it's teaching me that I know how to provide my, for myself and for my family. And if I want something bad enough, I'm going to go do it. That job taught me that. That's why I was confident to leave my job to make all this happen. Anyways, I'm about to hit the hour mark with one minute. So I'm going to let y'all go here. From our family here at Hit Squad TV to you, I wish you a wonderful day. I love you. There's absolutely you, nothing you can really do about that. So make sure you accept the love. Anyways, I'm Lloyd Knox. You've been a lovely audience and we'll see you tomorrow. Peace out.